participants are there we can start since uh, the first is uh, dr uh, Samruddhi Dhani. Samruddhi Dhani. Samruddhi Dhani. Okay, Samruddhi Dhani. Is she here? Okay. So, good afternoon all uh, and welcome to Hyde Park 2. I welcome the chairperson and the co-chairperson and my convener, Dr. Arundhati Tamuli. Unfortunately, Dr. Mohit, who is the moderator, is right now not here with us. So, instead of waiting, uh, wasting time, I think we'll go right about. So, Dr. Shamruti uh, Dani, and uh, she is going to be the first presenting author here. Bit by bit, two six six. Okay. Good afternoon. I will be presenting a case of simple limbal epithelial transplant done for limbal stem cell deficiency. Can I have the timer, please? Four minutes. I'll be presenting a case of simple limbal epithelial transplant done for limbal stem cell deficiency due to chronic vernal keratoconjunctivitis. A 20 years old male presented to us with complaints of gradual progressive diminution of vision in both the eyes since two months or more in the right eye than the left. He was a known case of vernal keratoconjunctivitis in both eyes and was using olopatidine eye drops and steroids on and off since the last five years. Uh, the best corrected visual acuity was 1 by 60 in the right eye and 6 by 18 in the left eye. And on slit lamp examination, there was a total absence of limbal palisades in both the eyes, along with 360 degrees superficial corneal vascularization and a thick panis with diffuse stromal scarring in the right eye and peripheral stromal scarring uh, sparing the central cornea in the left eye. So he was diagnosed as a case of both eyes limbal stem cell deficiency secondary to chronic vernal keratoconjunctivitis. We started the patient on both eyes topical tacrolimus 0.1% ointment, preservative free lubricant and lotiprednol eye drops. The left eye was managed conservatively and the right eye underwent an allogenic simple limbal epithelial transplant with amniotic membrane graft. Post-operatively, we started the right eye on topical prednisolone, ofloxacin, homotropin, and preservative-free lubricant drops. So this is a video of the right eye surgery. A 360 degrees peritomy was done. The panis was then slowly and carefully dissected away from the cornea with a crescent blade and it was excised. The amniotic membrane graft was then placed over the cornea, tucked in under the conjunctiva and secured in place with fibrin glue. Donor limbal tissue was excised and it was placed over the periphery of the cornea after dividing it into small bits. Fibrin glue was put and a bandage contact lens was applied. So post-operatively, the patient showed a remarkable improvement in the ocular surface as well as in the vision. And at two months post-slit, we could see regression of the vascularization along with resolution of the scarring with vision improving to 6 by 9 and improving further to 6 by 6 at one year post-slit. The steroids were also tapered topically and the patient by one year post-op was only on uh, topical immunomodulators. The anterior segment OCT and epithelial thickness map also showed that the preoperative irregular thick epithelium resolved to a much more uniform surface at two months and then at one year post-op. These changes were also confirmed on Pentacam and Zernike's analysis showed a remarkable improvement in the root mean square value from 7.9 to 4.2 reflecting the reduced aberrations of the eye. Limbal stem cell deficiency is seen in 1 to 2 percent of patients with vernal keratoconjunctivitis and it is a significant ocular morbidity. The prolonged use of benzalkonium containing drops in these patients could exacerbate the pre-existing limbal stem cell insult which occurs due to the chronic ocular surface inflammation. The, uh, this has also been proved in mouse models of limbal stem cell deficiency uh, showing the toxicity of higher concentrations of benzalkonium chloride in the eyes. So with minimal tissue, allogenic slit can cause remarkable improvement in the ocular surface and vision in these patients 
and hence it is important that there is timely identification of the inciting factors along with appropriate management to salvage vision in this young population of patients. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so any questions from me? Okay, this was allogenic slide from Cadaver. Yes, sir. Okay. So what is the patient getting this immunosuppression? Sorry. What immunosuppressives are used now? So right now he's on topical cyclosporine uh, point 0.1% eye drops using twice a day. Okay. Dr. Samruti, <coughs> uh, you have taken the uh, limbal tissue from the cadaveric eye, right? Yes, ma'am. So will there be any changes if you take from any living related means donor in the uh, visual uh, recovery? In visual recovery uh, will not, but the uh, uh, chances of rejection would be lower if it's a uh, living related donor, but uh, visually, if uh, if it is accepted well, then if it if it's taken up well, then it would produce the same results in either of the two yeah. cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, we can have Dr. Kalpana Vaishya. Dr. Kalpana, are you there? Okay, please come over. And uh, clinical profile of a case of acanthamoeba keratitis is our. Topic. What is sir? Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, yes, yes. present. Uh, be near the mic. Sir. I'm uh, going to present a clinical case profile on acanthamoeba keratitis. Acanthamoeba is a free-living cyst forming protozoa, ubiquitous in uh, air, soil, dust, and water. Life cycle consists of uh, motile trophozoid and dormant cystic uh, stasis, which is double wall. And cysts are extremely resistant to temperature, desiccation, and antimicrobial agents. And it is recognized as a severe site-threatening ocular infection in rural diet. Uh, and in, uh, <coughs> it is a retrospective study, inclusion criteria which include uh, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the, um, uh, the medical therapy of uh, acanthamoeba keratitis regardless of uh, participant age, uh, sex, and etiology of d disease uh, uh, and those with uh, complete follow-up data. <coughs> On staining, uh, corneal smear showing acanthamoeba uh, cyst and trophozoite. On confocal microscopy, uh, so, uh, showing double heart uh, wall cyst and uh, spindle like uh, pseudopodia within the basal epithelium with uh, trophozoites. <coughs> On uh, culture, uh, non-nutrient agar overlain with E. coli, uh, which uh, shows trophozoite migrating on the nutrient, uh, non-nutrient agar. This is the management uh, showing, uh, <coughs> this is the uh, uh, management with uh, anti acanthamoeba medication uh, with had aminoglycosacide uh, uh, like uh, uh, neo neomycin and paramomycin, which inhibit the protein synthesis and aromatic uh, diamidins uh, the, like uh, propamidin, isothionate, uh, uh, and hexamidin, uh, which inhibit the DNA synthesis and biguanide, uh, polyhexamethylene biguanide, and chlorhexidine. Uh, which inhibit the uh, function of the cell membrane and uh, imidazole uh, like clotrim uh, clotrimoxazole and ketoconazole and fluconazole which destabilizes the cell wall. <coughs> Conclusion, uh, acanthamoeba is uh, difficult to treat uh, with a uh, prolonged uh, course and requiring multiple antiseptic drugs. Early diagnosis of acanthamoeba is crucial for effective treatment of acanthamoeba keratitis. Pain disproportionate to clinical sign in early presentation and in late presentation, uh, patient may be painless. And in fulminant uh, late acanthamoeba keratitis, uh, therapeutic uh, keratoplasty uh, may be uh, required. This item reference of my uh, topic. Okay, so can you tell differences in neomycin and paramomycin? Any differences you found? Uh, your experience? Neomycin uh, inhibit the. So it is easily available, and if other drugs are not available, yes, like PHMB and all, available. then you can uh, definitely use neomycins. It is available and it's uh, severe in these cases. So, paramomycin, uh, can you throw more light on it? It is not uh, easily available. Neomycin is uh, uh, easy to uh, easily available in the market. Oh, paramomycin is not available. Okay. Not available. Theoretically, not available. Okay. A quick word, I would request all the speakers to be very comfortable, no need to be an anxious and nervous. Yeah. So uh, have a smile on your face and it's a homely hall you can say and nobody is going to sue you for anything. Whatever you know is the highest and the best. You have prepared, none other have prepared. So please come here with the cheerful mood.
the next speaker and dr aditya please i request the next speakers to be prepared and uh, sitting on the first row good afternoon everyone topic of my presentation is collateral trichomycianum of phytopathogenic fungus causing keratitis so corneal ulceration is a significant cause of corneal blindness population of 1130 mil per million was affected in mother districts of india which is already documented and mycotic keratitis constitutes a major share of it so most frequent microorganism that cause mycotic keratitis include filamentous fungi mostly fusarium and aspergillus after that dematiaceous fungi and previously noted as rare fungal pathogens exerhylum cladosporium acrimonium cladosporium are now making their mark so collatotrichum corda is a complex form of genus which belongs to a class of silomycetes uh, and they are fungal plant pathogens causing anthracnosis which appear as a black necrotic spots on mango leaves and fruits actually so the five important species which are known to cause infective keratitis are coccoides crassipes dematium gliosporioides and graminicola and the asianum comes under under gliosporoides complex so we are describing here three cases of infective keratitis secondary to collatotrichum asianum in southern part of india so the first case was a 34 year old female she had a history of fall of dust in left eye while picking mangoes from the tree she, uh, the left eye showed epithelial defect of 2 by 2 mm size with infiltrate of 3 by 3 mm which was in the superficial stroma and after the initial microbiological workup the scrapes showed uh, the fungal filaments on koh mount uh, so we started on topical natamycin 5% and oricon 1% on hourly basis in the first week and they were tapered uh, subsequently so the epithelial defect healed in 2 weeks and the corneal infiltrate completely resolved in 4 weeks the second was a similar case uh, around epithelial defect of uh, 2 by 2 mm size and the infiltrate of 4 by 4 mm which also resolved with the combination therapy of natamycin and oriconazole she uh, and uh, uh, he also had a history of accidental injury with a tree branch while working in the fields the case 3 unfortunately we don't have a uh, image of the same but uh, the infiltrate was a very uh, minimal as compared to the first two cases and it responded uh, responded to the topical natamycin so in the microbiological workup at the end of two days woolly aerial fungal mycelia with gray colonies were seen and the colonies assumed a salmon color and the end of it uh, they assumed a dark brown color on microscopic examination the cornelia were hyaline or septate with rounded ends with the one celled and uh, gutulate similar to the description that was documented already but in the mango anthracnose diseases in the plant diseases so uh, actual species identification is based on the phylogenetic analysis which is done uh, properly by the nucleic acid sequencing of the internal transcribed spacer dna of the r dna which was done in our cases so ultimately the species of collatotrichum asianum asian was confirmed coming to the discussion part the fungal keratitis is a major component as we all know uh, and the major component is by fusarium aspergillus and dematiaceous fungi but the genus collatotrichum was first described by uh, corda in 1831 and it is actually known to cause anthracnose diseases in the kharif crops and pulse uh, and pulses and fruits it is also known to cause subcutaneous and systemic manifestations but all those manifestations are in the immunocompromised patients in contrast to our patients so uh, all the reports are there actually of the collatotrichum other species like truncatum came in the initial phases like in 2004 first report was in 2004 and later two other reports came from other parts of india and all those reports were of truncatum and later on dematium and graminicola came but uh, asianum is not reported till now and these are the species which we are talking about so our case showed a central infiltrate involving visual axis with irregular fluffy margins it was a superficial corneal involvement with the absence of endothelial plaques and ring infiltrate coming to the treatment part the treatment is not tailored according to the species in the collatotrichum yeah, as far as the collatotrichum is concerned initial case reports described good response to natamycin but the subsequent reports describe a preferable minimal inhibitory drug inhibitory concentration for amprotrasin b so the coming to the take home points though the infiltrate was uh, uh, the small in size and superficial involvement involvement was there uh, correct species identification is needed for the uh, to avoid the further progression of the disease thank you thank you any expert comments from the panel no uh, species identification rightly you said but the facilities may not be available that yes, is the issue we are facing yes sir so in that case we need to collaborate with uh, higher centers or nearby centers 
uh, nowadays uh, cornea facilities developing in many of the government and private sectors also so that may be noted by yes ma'am yes. nice presentation thank you i invite the next speaker and dr uma meena is she here so we call dr uma meena to be absent now we proceed to the next presentation by dr pragya ahuja dr pragya okay you are Good morning, respected uh, moderators, fe fellow colleagues, and presenters. I'm going to present: Is it possible to predict genetic predisposition for diabetic retinopathy? The role of RAGE SNP analysis. Um, as we know that every third patient of diabetes has some form of diabetic retinopathy. Advanced glycation end products are heterogeneous products which are formed by non-enzymatic reaction between glucose-derived carbonyls with amino groups of amino acids. This interaction between advanced glycation end products and its receptor is integral in the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. Normally, uh, this receptor internalizes these low levels of advanced glycation end products in normal individuals and metabolizes them so that the harmful effects are not seen. However, in diabetes, this production is so much that the internalization of these products is not possible because of which there is an accumulation of advanced glycation end products which leads to uh, the production and downstream signaling cascade that releases various cytokines, chemokines and growth factors like VEGF which collectively damage the cells of the retina and cause diabetic retinopathy. Any polymorphism in this receptor will have an influence on the pathway and have an influence on the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy and the progression of the same. Over 30 polymorphisms have been documented in this RAID gene, most of which are single nucleotide polymorphisms that have caused an altered function and expression of his gene, especially when it is locate, located in the regulatory region. So coming to this uh, flow chart, it is basically how the intracellular hyperglycemia releases various uh, interleukins, chemokines uh, uh, and cytokines which causes an alteration of the blood retinal barrier and retinal ischemia by causing thrombosis and microaneurysms, which increases vascular permeability, ultimately leading to macular edema and various features of other diabetic retinopathy like vitreous hemorrhage and retino de retinal detachment. Basically, we did a literature research for uh, searching which single nucleotide polymorphisms are associated with it and the pathophysiology behind it. Advan as I said, they are formed by non-enzymatic non reaction and it transforms the amatory products at the intermediates which are formed, which form deoxyglucosone and methyl glyoxid. Ultimately, gl glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and DHAP are formed, which ultimately lead to the formation of uh, advanced glycation end products. This is uh, the role of these cytokines and chemokines at various levels in the retinal cells which promote basement membrane thickening, ECM degradation, parasite loss. This is the various pathways by which advanced glycation end products are basically formed. There is an over-functioning over of the polyol pathway, hexosamine, hexosamine, hexosamine pathway. Adva there is increased advanced glycation end products by increased production of glyoxyls. There is activation of protein kinase C. There is increased production of reaction, reactive oxygen species, all of which have a role in the formation of uh, advanced glycation end products. These cause uh, further increased expression of NF-kappa B. They attach to the uh, plasma membrane and increase the procoagulant activity. They, they, cause for, they in reverse cause uh, reactive oxygen species overproduction, which is responsible for more advanced glycation end product formation. As I said, increased protein kinase C, there's breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, there's NO depletion, and there is increased release. 
so when the basically when the rage advanced glycation attach on this is rage gene is a 35 kilo dalton transmembrane protein belonging to the immunoglobulin family present in various cells in the body like pancreas beta cells lymphocytes monocytes neuronal cells and endothelial cells apart from uh, advanced glycation it has other bindings uh, to other cml s hundreds a beta uh, oligomers this is uh, located on the short arm of chromosome 6 and it has uh 1.7 kilo, uh, kb 5 flank uh, flanking region with 11 exons 10 introns and base and has variable slice variants but uh, what we aim to do and plan have research plan in the future is working on this regulatory gene and identifying those specific single nucleotide polymorphisms that are co- uh, that are having an influence on the diabetic retinopathy and the progression of this so that we can pick uh, and use it as a genetic marker screening for identifying patients at risk and it will help in reducing the various microvascular complications because picking these patients at an earlier stage will help them in um life and mo- uh, lifestyle modifications and they can be picked at an earlier stage when we can intervene and prevent uh, visual disabilities thank you so much thank you thank you sir any comments do you know of any published study of this analysis or any other contemporary gene analysis that has been relevant clinically yes um so till now uh, only 10 researches have been published worldwide most of which uh, it was a multi center trial in 19 a multi uh, gene trial which was done in 1992 at shankara in hyderabad and uh, they have sh- uh, shown uh, proven role of 11 9 out of the 11 genes that they studied Ma- large scale application has not been done mainly due to the financial constraint that is involved in doing these studies to extrapolate because Four five hundred is the maximum that we are able to go with these studies. Shankar, they had funding, so they went up to thousand. So to have an uh, widespread influence, we need an integration for a large database with multi-centric trials to have an effect, not only at localized one area, but maybe uh, in north, south, east, west zonal areas should be there. We are working on a local uh, local cohort in uh, North India for this study. We'll be coming out with it very soon. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker is going to be Dr. Oyendrila Chakraborty. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am presenting a topic on branched retinal vein occlusion and dyslipidemia, which is a hospital-based case series study, and this is an observational-only study. The branch retinal vein occlusion is the most common among all types of RVOs and in India its prevalence is around 0.66%. Most commonly it is found to affect the superior temporal quadrant and the common pathology behind it is to be the common atriovenous adventitial sheath and the glial sheath. The visual acuity at the presentation and prognosis usually depend upon whether the macula has been involved or not and the ocular fundus picture can range from any any type of intraretinal hemorrhages Uh, soft cotton wool spots or macular edema the workhouse triad is also believed to play a major role in the path- pathogenesis uh, our aim was to estimate the proportion of patients having dyslipidemia who were diagnosed with brvo in ocular fundus examination and it's a descriptive observational case series study where a total of 38 individuals who turned up at our outpatient department in ophthalmology during a period of 6 years were uh, taken up for the study and the inclusion and the exclusion criteria are given here necessary clearance from the institutional ethics committee was taken the case details the history patient history their personal history and every uh, detail was entered in a prescribed case record pro forma after we uh, noted the bcva and the pupillary reaction thoroughly we dilated both uh, their eyes with eye drop tropicamide plus phenylephrine and after adequate dilatation we examined the ocular fundus with indirect of ophthalmoscope and slit lamp biomicroscope with suitable lenses the ocular fundus findings were recorded as superficial or deep intraretinal hemorrhages the part of the retina involved any exudates we observed or any kind of vascular anomalies seen The study participants who were diagnosed clinically with BRVO were further counseled to get a serum lipid profile done and after they had their blood test done 
if it is found that it was positive for dyslipidemia, they were further asked to get management for the same. Uh, the normal reference guidelines used for serum lipid profile according to NCEP and ATP3 guidelines were given here. The laterality, severity and the prognosis of the all case, uh, cases were explained properly and the management was explained to the patients. Uh, the table one here summarizes the socio-demographic characteristics of the study participants and including the gender, the age group that we most uh, encountered. The table two here summarizes the clinical findings of ocular fundus, which shows the quadrant they, it involved, the involvement of macula, and this, uh, did we find co cotton wool spots or not. Out of the 38 study participants who were clinically diagnosed, there were 14 individuals who were found to have BRBO, which accounts for 36.8% of the study subjects, which we cons consider to be fairly high. And out of these 14, six were females and eight were males. It is found that in most cases of the BRVO, they were diagnosed in the age group of 40 to 60 years, and in the second most group, it was 80 to 90 years of age group. And the diagnosed, uh, BRVO was diagnosed most commonly in the superior temporal quadrant, which amounts to 65.7% of the cases, which agrees to the most common probable pathogenetic factor. 57.1% of the diagnosed study participants were male, and 36.8% of the study participants were diagnosed having dyslipidemia, which is similar to the studies conducted by Agarwal et al. and Sheikh K. M. et al. In conclusion, BRVO is a potentially vision-threatening disease depending upon the severity and the involvement of macula where, it can, where the vision can be as low as 6 by 60 or less associated with some metamorphosia. Dyslipidemia has been documented a very important risk factor for the development of BRVO in middle, most commonly in middle age group. And it is sometimes found that undiagnosed dyslipidemia can be found in BRVO who have come with vision pulse. Prompt management with individualized specific treatment is the goal and management for dyslipidemia has to be done for a proper um, pr holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the panel? Yeah, I just saw your last slide that you excluded, uh, treated uh, patients with hypertension, etc. So when uh, before your study, did you exclude any other comorbidities? Yes, we uh, excluded any other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, or any other forms of uh, venous occlusive or vascular, vascular disorders. They would be taking uh, medications for. We also ruled out the cases uh, where they might be have a history of OCP intake or who had histories of um, venous, uh, venous disorders of the legs. So any other comorbidities were ruled out properly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, sorry. now we are going to have the presentation from Dr. Ankur Barua. Is he here? Okay. So the last presentation here, uh, Oh, sorry, there are more on uh, this page. Uh, and Dr. Vinayak Mehta is invited from our side to give his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Vinayak Mehta, and the topic of my presentation is uh, progression of diabetic retinopathy in patients using uh, gliptins versus patients using other hypoglycemic agents. Being in India, we all are familiar with the burden of diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Uh, current treatment uh, guidelines focuses on fairly advanced stages of diabetic retinopathy and no uh, treatment options can prevent or delay the onset or progression of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, recent studies using SDOCT have shown uh, that neurodegeneration in retina starts much sooner then the clinically uh, vas visible vascular signs. DPP-4 inhibitors are a new class of anti-hypoglycemic uh, agents uh, which uh, can be used and are also known to have neuroprotective benefits because they can reduce the uh, pro uh, apoptosis of pericytes and Muller cells and they also have a reduction in uh, oxidative and inflammatory stress on retina. So they kind of provide dual benefit to the patients and can be hypothesized to have a uh, 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 delay the onset of progression of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so we did a prospective study uh, where 60 patients uh, were in group using uh, gliptins and there were 60 patients using other uh, hypoglycemic agents. Patients who had type 1 diabetes, hazy media, 
uncontrolled hypertension, poor glycemic control, or uh, they had a history of uh, previous treatment for diabetic retinopathy were excluded from this study. Uh, all patients underwent a, comp a comprehensive ophthalmology examination using slit lamp, uh, fundoscopy, grading of diabetic retinopathy, fundus camera, and OCT. Uh, all patients were followed up after one year. So the results that we obtained is that uh, most of our patients, 70% of the patients had a duration of diabetes for less than 15 years. Uh, the uh, graph over there shows that number of insulin users in the non-gliptin group were significantly more. And uh, the patients who were in the gliptin group, 53% uh, of the patients had taken it for more than two years and 47% used gliptins for less than two years. Uh, the table one over there shows that uh, there's a fairly comparable values of HbA1c in both the groups over the period of study, which tells us that uh, there was a good glycemic control maintained throughout the study period. Uh, table two and table three shows us that, uh, shows the number of eyes, not the number of patients. It shows the number of eyes with diabetic retinopathy status at first visit and second visit in both the groups. What we observed that eight out of 120 eyes in the gliptin group had progression of diabetic retinopathy and 11 eyes in non-gliptin uh, group had progression. The p-value was 0.473 and it was statistically non-significant. Uh, coming to the discussion part, uh, the studies that I've mentioned, it shows that uh, most of the studies are in favor that gliptins have a neuroprotective benefit, but none of them, but most of them uh, could not prove that it was statistically significant. Uh, one of the studies which was done by Green JB showed that uh, patients had a contradictory uh, benefit, contradictory results to the current belief and patients in cetagliptin group uh, had more progression than the placebo group. Uh, as observed that in our studies, even though the gliptin groups had lesser uh, progression of diabetic retinopathy, but it was not statistically important. The strength of our studies lies in having a good glycemic control and fairly comparable group uh, uh, and using ETDRS classification and limitations being smaller sample size and shorter duration of follow-up. I conclude my study by saying that DPP-4 inhibitors did not have any added advantage over the other hypoglycemic agents, nor did it have any deleterious effects. And we can recommend having a prospect of a large study with a larger uh, sample size and longer uh, duration of follow-up. Thank you. Any comments? Tell me one thing which we gained out of this presentation. Sir, there are so many uh, hypoglycemic agents that we have been using, uh, uh, but gliptins are a new class of drugs and still we are comparing it the efficacy compared to the other ones. There is no drug or treatment option that currently we are using for diabetic retinopathy which can halt it at the beginning of the onset. Uh, whatever treatment options we have is once the patient has already crossed moderate NPDR or is in severe NPDR. So we cannot uh, prevent the onset, but if we're treating a patient with diabetes and we start them uh, uh, treating with them gliptins, not only we are providing a good glycemic control for the patients, but we are also trying to uh, reduce the uh, onset. So that if we reduce the uh, duration of the onset of diabetic retinopathy, along with good glycemic control, we are providing fairly good amount of years for a patient to have a good to maintain good vision. See, my point is. Some or the other drug will have to be given to control diabetes. Yes, sir. No drug come, uh, you know, claims that it will halt the progression of diabetic retinopathy. Same came out with these gliptins. Yes, sir. So, what new we found out? Uh, sir, it has all. It has only added to the current knowledge of our uh, uh, like status about the gliptins. But uh, being a smaller study and a shorter uh, follow-up. We cannot uh, tell anything based on the evidence, but we can definitely have a prospect of a bigger study. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, sir. I invite Dr. Vignesh to be here for his presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my topic is the uh, epilinone in the treatment of uh, bullous variant of central serous coli retinopathy. Uh, we all know that bullous uh, variant is a uh, little rare uh, compared to other forms of CSCR. So this study was uh, to the aim was to study the efficacy of epilinone in the treatment of bullous variant of CSCR. 
it was a retrospective international case series. Uh, uh, four eyes of four patients with Bullas CSCR who were treated with oral epilirinone, 25 milligram once daily, and had, had, had at least three months of follow-up were included in the study. Best credit visual acuity, FFA, uh, OCT at baseline were recorded, and the BCVA and OCT at the follow-up visits were also recorded. So all the patients were males. All the patients had complete resolution of macular and inferior bullous sectal detachment. Two eyes had complete resolution at the third month follow-up, one eye at the fourth month follow-up, and one eye at the fifth month follow-up. BCVA improved in three eyes and remained stable in one eye. Two eyes had undergone uh, additional micropulse yellow laser. The case one, a 38-year-old male patient, left eye defectivation of three days duration, and uh, BCVA of 6 by 60, we can see a dense subretinal fibrin, and uh, uh, also inferior bullous detachment with multiple leaks on the FFA combined angiography. So from baseline, uh, from baseline, like, uh, like there was significant regression of fibrin as well as SRF with complete resolution at the end of fourth month. So at the end of two months, the leaks were reduced, so additional uh, sub subthreshold micropulse laser also was done. Uh, the B scan from the baseline, the complete resolution was seen at the end of third month. And, uh, and the vision improved to 6-9. Uh, case 2, a 42-year-old male patient, defective vision of uh, right eye of one month duration, and BCV was 6-6 six, six par partial. And there was a shallow fluid at the fovea, but however, there was an inferior retinal detachment, bullous retinal detachment seen. Uh, so the, even th that fluid, shallow fluid resolved, uh, subretinal uh, fluid, the macular resolved first month. However, for the complete resolution of the inferior detachment, it took three months. Case three, a 41-year-old male patient, BCVA 4 by 60, defective vision of left eye of one month duration. History of CSCR 10 years back, treated with uh, laser. So here, uh, like, uh, we did micropulse yellow laser along with the epilirodon from the baseline. And uh, we can see a very good regression from baseline, like of the subretinal fibrin as well as SRF with a complete resolution at the end of fifth, fifth month. And uh, B scan taken at second month shows a complete resolution at the end of the fifth month. And the final BCVA improved to 612. Case 4, 38 year old male, defective vision of right eye again one month duration, BCVA of 3 by 60. So we can see a dense subretinal fibrin at the fovea uh, with uh, two leaks as well as uh, the inferior bullous detachment. So from baseline, there was a like, gradual reduction of the subretinal fibrin as well as the SRF. However, there was a residual uh, subretinal fibrin that is seen subfovially. So the vision improved uh, from 3 by 6 to 24. Uh, the, the inferior bullous detachment uh, completely resolved the end of three months. So bullous variant of CSCR is a rare, atypical, and severe form of CSCR usually seen bilaterally in patients on long-term steroid treatment and organ transplantation. Characterized by multiple PEDs, cloudy subretinal fluid, dense subretinal fibrin, inferior exudative retinal detachment, and RPE tears. Epilirinone has been used in the treatment of uh, B, uh, Bullas CSCR, like uh, previously, like three case reports have been published. Uh, in two cases, one case had a multifocal CSCR with a low serum cortisol, and another case of Bullas CSCR with giant RPE macro rip. In another study, epilirinone was combined along with PDT in one eye and the laser photocoagulation in the other eye with a complete resolution. Uh, in my study, like epilinone treatment resulted in complete resolution of bullous CSCR in all the four eyes of the four patients. Two patients had been given additional micropulse laser. Uh, this is the first case series uh, to show the efficacy of epilinone in the treatment of bullous CSCR. A larger study with a longer follow-up is warranted. These are my references. Thank you. Yeah. Doctor, why did you add the micropulse laser? What was the indication that you added with it? Uh, so actually, like uh, the first patient I had, like there was a decrease in the leaks. I just did accidentally the FFA repeated. So because uh, we were worried that patient was worried that it was not completely resolving. So when I did the uh, FFA, so I could see that leaks had decreased. So initially I could not do because of the fibrin at the, at the area of the leakage. So then when I added that, it augmented the like faster faster resolution. So the aim was to uh, the, make the like fluid to go away as early as possible. So I had added micropulse, but other cases had like significant decrease even without adding. So I did not add in the other two cases. Did you follow up any of the cases after yes, three yes. months? Yes, they, they are under follow up. Actually, I, like uh, because of the COVID, like few two cases could not come for follow up after the final resolution. So once they are completely resolved and vision is improving, they are not following up. That's the problem with the uh, follow up on the longer longer follow up. So you do not have the follow up. So no, we have follow up. We have follow up, but not for not a long. Not all the patients. Yes, you yes. have four patients, so two you don't have. Yes, yes, two I don't. So okay. after the resolution, they didn't follow. Okay. Once you put a patient on epilirinone, how do you uh, track the course of the patient in terms of the drug? 
any kind of blood investigations you need or what are the expected side effect of this drug yeah so first i uh, when and we, before we start the drug we have to do a like fission evaluation to rule out any cardiac disease hypertension as well as uh, serum potassium levels has to be taken because it is a, it is a potassium sparing diuretic so the potassium has to be below 5 to start the drug and then once i start with the 25 mg od once daily and i explain to the side effects like dizziness giddiness muscle pain and chest pain to the patient and once they develop they have to stop the drug and report to us immediately and then i follow up every every month and uh, repeat the serum potassium along with the oct when we do that uh, repeat the serum potassium and if it is any increasing like uh, beyond 5 we stop the drug so then then maybe those cases will need additional laser uh, but none of my cases develop that uh, hyperkalemia so we, we, it could be safely given 25 mg once we make it 50 mg like the western literature says for chronic cscr we may have like more case of hyperkalemia in indian patients maybe there uh, like the dosage required for western population may be higher than the indian population so that needs a bit of caution that it cannot be given unsupervised you cannot leave a patient on nepilethrone for 3 months and 4 months so one has to we there and the pictures which you have shown it might be a thought that just came in my mind that idiopathic bullous csr which we see usually they don't carry fibrin usually such kind of pictures are not there so was there any specific subset of patients you choose because whatever uh, idiopathic csr what we label they never carry this kind of fibrin multiple leaks are usually not there so was is any secondary cause of fluid in these patients did you explore or did you rule out because these pictures are classically not the idiopathic csr do you agree yes so, so actually only one case had a, like a history of steroid intact before but we, we it was not very clear history he was not able to tell that because he had lost all these reports so that that was the only uh, uh, in one patient alone so other patients didn't had history of csr before so two uh, i mean actually three patients had history of csr before so it is very ambiguous we have four patients and all are of different subsets and what do you call cscr that has to show on an oct a leak or a cs a smoke stack pattern or something like that or a pooling of dye somewhere in a ped but never these multiple kind of things and it looked more of a secondary kind of thing and exudation and fibrin coming in usually not seen in in an idiopathic cscr so do you advocate epilirenone in an idiopathic cscr or you define the usage of this drug in a very particular subset of patients no this was like only the common thing in all the four cases was subretinal fibrin and inferior bullous detachment so however i use uh, epilirenone in all case of chronic cscr so whenever wherever like we have bilateral cases with multiple leaks i usually do less, i mean so i usually give epilirenone but if there are unifocal or two two or three two or up to two or three leaks i do laser should but we I, reconsider giving the topic of usage of epilirenone in a recalcitrant or a resistant csr rather than a bullous idiopathic csr no in this series uh, the problem was like we could not do laser in every case because of the fibrin because the laser may not penetrate deeper to act in this cases so the epilirone will be a better option in this case subset of cscr where there is dense subretinal fibrin above okay. the leaks so this is what we learned that if there is fibrin and uh, exudation yes. and it's a recalcitrant case you are not able to do ca laser then you can think of an additional therapy in the form of epilirone okay. that is good now we have filtered out yeah okay. and in your second case like you have shown that vision visual acuity it was only 66 part yes. and fovea was also not involved, not involved and there was a small uh, like detachment no so in this case there would have been different option i think like uh but th- there was a inferior bullous detachment was yeah, there yeah. so patient had a field defect yeah. so like uh, so i t- i mean i gave first laser along with the pleron is there is any chances of spontaneous like uh, uh spontaneous is like i have seen in two cases where we could not give epilirone because of the systemic uh, uh, abnormalities like patient had renal failure so those cases i have not included here because the patient having long long term like uh, renal failure cases or cardiac problems are already having some like potassium abnormalities so those cases we could not give so one of the patient like uh, i i just gave nepofenac only uh, just uh, to be on the safer side just mm-hmm. for anti inflammatory role whether maybe i i'm, I'm not uh, sure about that okay. but then i followed up the case and then uh, that case resolved uh, in 3 months time okay. so we'll that also is a possibility so we, yeah. but whether whether we could have a observation of in this series is a question thank okay. you dr thank rignesh you thank you and i invite a quick presentation from dr vijaya agarwala dr vijaya no okay So is Dr. Vikas Sharma over here? Please do come, Vikas, and give your presentation. 
he will be talking about sutureless and glue free limbal conjunctival auto grafting in primary and second recurrent pterygium yeah. Great. good afternoon everyone this is my topic of presentation so as we all know pterygium is the subconjunctival fibrovascular growth which uh, comes over to the cornea it has multifactorial etiologies but uv exposure remains the significant one treatment modalities are mainly surgical however recurrence is the leading cause of surgical failure the purpose of our study was to evaluate and analyze the outcome of sutureless glue free limbal conjunctival autografting after excision of pterygium in cases of primary as well as recurrent pterygium so my study duration was one year the study uh, the study was conducted at a tertiary eye care center in delhi it was a prospective interventional study we recruited 70 patients out of which 40 Five were uh, having primary pterygium and 25 were uh, recurrent pterygium group. We did uh, we did Wilcoxon match pair test and man Whitney U test for comparative statistics and independent sample respectively. The p value of less than 0.5 was uh, taken as statistically significant. We included all pa uh, patients of all age and either sex with primary as well as recurrent pterygium, and these are the exclusion criteria. The goal of our surgery was to complete excision of the pterygium with restoration of normal conjunctile anatomy with the help of the graft and to prevent recurrence. These were my uh, outcome measure. My primary outcome measure was recurrence of the pterygium or, and we defined uh, recurrence as any fibrovascular regrowth across the limbus. My uh, secondary outcome measure were graft related complications and change in best characters with the equity. These, uh, this particular slide shows the mean age of the patient in the, both the groups. This is the sex distribution in both the group, male uh, preponderance was more. And uh, this is the outcome measure. Our primary outcome, we noticed two cases in the recurrent pterygium to be having pterygium. It was 8% of the total recruited uh, population in the group two. And uh, these were the graft related complication. We noticed graft edema was the most common complication. And uh, in seven and four, uh, in group one and group two patients uh, respectively, and two and three patient and was having graft uh, retraction in the group one and group two. We did not notice any graft loss, and uh, two patients in uh, recurrent pterygium group developed tenon cyst. There was a change in best corrected visual acuity was not statistically significant in both the groups. This is my master chart. Coming to the discussion part, we had uh, two patients, total 8% of the population in that uh, group two patient, which found uh, with the recurrence and uh, which might be attributable to the inadvented inclusion of the tenon in the graft or because of the aggravated tissue response due to the younger age of the patient. The main disadvantage uh, of sutureless glue-free technique is the risk of graft loss. To combat that, we advise to patch the graft for at least 48 hours post-surgery for better adherence and minimize chances of graft edema. To conclude, sutureless glue-free glimbal conjunctival autografting is a safe, effective and economical and less time-consuming procedure, not only in primary pterygium but as well in recurrent pterygium as well. Surgical outcome following this particular surgery are comparable to most commonly performed suture limbal conjunctival autograft and less it is it gives less patient discomfort better patient satisfaction but a randomized multi-center trial with a large cohort and longer follow-up warrants the substantiate our finding it was a pilot study these are my references thank you thank you dr vikas uh, dr vikas no. uh, you've taken auto conjunctival graft right from that's, the same eye so yeah. what is the position you normally choose from we take it from inferior temporal quadrant ma'am. inferior temporal yeah. quadrant any particular reason Superior, we generally uh, want to avoid. Okay. In temporal, do you think more chances of infection and one more point yeah. forty eight hours will be patching? Yeah. So how do you? How we do did it under uh, ointment uh, moxifloxacin, ma'am. Okay. The patching for forty eight hours. But uh, there will be always a small fear that infection. Yeah, because inferiorly. Okay. You did these surgeries under block or topical? No, it was under block. Sir. Under block. Yeah. If I talk of patient's perspective, I have experienced faculty here. So, patching somebody for 48 hours, how would be the uh, response from the patient rather than opening the patch after 3 hours or 4 hours and putting 2 sutures on the graft or 4 sutures? Mm, uh, we have done, kept it for 2 hours, 2 days, yes. 
but uh, not always it's not i would say that the patient is compliant 100% percent. patients are not compliant no, just the patient's but perspective still, most of most of them are compliant if you can explain it to them that a suture would create a foreign body sensation later on so we've just left your graft with the glue free and sutureless so i have convinced patient but then he said he didn't lose a graft that's one thing we lost a graft and it's very surprising because that is how we kept and i uh, had two instances where the graft was lost patient did not comply to us although when he came back he said he did comply yeah. but you know it, it it opens up so so i think it's happen. a personal preference it's a personal preference it's, it's okay. some it, patients do usually comply i uh, do sutures and and people they say for one day or two and just give copious lubricants and maybe a ointment at bed time a gel at bed time yes of course that is happy. how we were practic- i was doing the same thing for yeah. years together but now with this fib- fibrin we just use okay. the auto uh, like serum of the patient and just yes. put a bit and just stick it up so that does does give very good results this so is you patch for a day yes 48 hours no 48, 48 hours. hours 48 hours minimum okay. that's that's the thing that is what i said that not that yes. 100% patients are compliant okay. this is one thing and one more thing i would like to ask you about the graft did you uh, mark the limbal mark, area yes. and yes. did we you did do it them. did you turn it and yes. did you do anything of yes. that sort we did mark with the help of the dye so and what is the marker. size of the graft that you took It, we is it the uh, same universally no, or no. do you mark it according to the size of the pterygium we uh, size of the excision ma'am what we yes, get that after is what the excision and uh, yes. we were marking up 1.5 to 1 mm more correct yeah. correct yeah okay thank, thank you, you dr vikas yes uh, doctor i just okay. want to uh, I just want to ask you one thing like how long you have done the follow up because I have seen with the like no uh, blood like it dislocate even after a week also Yes ma'am huh. we took follow up for a year ma'am 12 months post surgery So it was intact all yes, the cases Yes absolutely and after a few weeks you can't even see the graft it is that clear I think one year was not needed <laughs> Yes <laughs> We were doing it for the recurrence ma'am Okay, okay. You the main thing that you pointed out very well is the edema of the graft yes, this is the one, part where we really have to counsel the patient yes. because because of the clot or whatever is below yes. the graft is edematous and the patient keeps on complaining of yes. that redness around that that's so correct that's one thing and what is happens is if we don't you really have to do a very good counseling time, the graft swells up with the surrounding yes, uh, yes, yes. whatever fluid is there also we if we start immediately the drops after 24 hours then that drops also goes behind the graft and absolutely up. absolutely thank, thank you. you so much yeah thank you dr vikas and uh, can i invite dr jagrati khudania please come and give your presentation good afternoon i'm going to present a case on snake venom of thalamic uveitis to begin with snake venom of thalmia is caused by venoms of spitting elephant and other snakes among snake species spitting cobras a member of the elephant family snakes can spit venom from jubinoise gland while irritated or threatened after a toxin spray attack the eyes are most often affected causing inflammatory responses in the anterior segment of the eye in venom spray of thalmia many symptoms such as periocular soft tissue swelling hyperemia conjunctivitis corneal epithelial erosion to corneal opacity uveitis are common complications after venom spray ocular complications in the posterior segment are often observed after snake bite so your a 12 year old female presented with burning sensation watering redness diminution of vision and pain in the left eye since one day after experiencing snake spit her visual acuity in the left eye was 6 by 24 On further examination the conjunctiva was mildly congested cornea was mildly hazy and fluorescent stain positive lesions were present in the pupillary area along with dusting capes on the endothelium of the inferior quadrant uh, the patient had aqueous cells and flare 1 plus and the iris was gray grayish brown in color with mild changes due to edema her pupillary reaction was sluggish although uh, on fundus examination the media was slightly hazy and the optic disc was apparently normal uh, the ocular examination of the right eye Uh, were not that significant the findings were not that significant rather uh, so a diagnosis of snake venom of thalamic uveitis of left eye was made 
after which copious irrigation of the left eye with normal saline was done after installation of proparacaine 0.5 percent eye drop and the patient was put on a combination of moxifloxacin and dexamethasone uh, starting six times in the left eye for two weeks and gradually tapering over an interval of two weeks along with that the patient was prescribed uh, atropin one percent I drop olopatidine and carboxymethyl cellulose 0.5% and the patient was advised to use dark goggles and review after one week. So during the follow-up, uh, the congestion was reduced, also the fluorescent stain was negative and the cells and flare were absent in the AC and her visual acuity from 6 by 24 improved to 6 by 18 in the left eye. And in the follow-up during the second week, her visual acuity further improved in the left eye to 6 by 9. So concluding with the, that the spitting cobras along with the elephant family uh, belong to the elephant family of the snakes. Snakes of these species have characteristic fangs with anteriorly placed openings and can spit venom up to a distance of 8 to 12 feet. It is the nature of the cobra to spit venom at predators or prey and humans are accidentally affected. These snakes can also directly transfer venom via bite. Spitting cobra venom contains a mixture of neurotoxin, cardiotoxin, phospholipases and cytotoxins. Cardiotoxins with the membrane lytic properties are thought to be responsible for the corneal erosions and conjunctival chemosis. The ocular effects of the venom depend on the duration of the contact of the ocular surface with the venom. Delay in washout and ex increased exposure can cause scarring of the cornea and loss of vision. Ocular contact with snake venom results in pain, diminution of vision, blepharospasm, conjunctival inflammation and chemosis. Initially, there may be small fluorescence staining corneal epithelial defects. The epithelial, uh, the epithelial cells, they lies to form a larger epithelial defect or erosion. Systemic effects of snake venom ophthalmia have not been reported. Co copious irrigation of the eyes with water at the earliest is the single most important step in management of this condition. This removes venom from the eyes and hence prevents corneal damage due to various toxins in it. Topical steroids, antibiotics, histam antihistaminics and anesthetic eye drops have been reported as treatments for snake venom spit of thalmia. Heparin, owing to its chelating agent, has been shown to effectively reduce venom-induced ocular complications in experimental studies. However, it has not yet approved for clinical use. Since there is no evidence showing that the anti-venom treatment elevates venom spit of thalmia, topical or IV anti-venom treatment is neither necessary nor recommended. These are my references. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any uh, comments? Yeah, uh, doctor. Your references, do they talk of the same type of uh, snake? Uh, Ma'am, I'm not sure about the snake variety because the patient was a kid and neither the attendant or the patient were not sure about what kind the no, snake No, not was. in your case. Your case, you did say that it was a spitting cobra. Yeah. Your references, I'm asking. Uh, references, ma'am, uh, it is related to basically the cobras of the species. Uh, they so these were all cobra cobras, studies. Yes, it's a very interesting case, I must say, because I haven't seen this. It's a very yes, sir. interesting case. We did not, like, this is the first case so I've seen. This was a kid? Huh? This was a kid? A 12 year old kid, female, child. So anybody whom I have missed out, whose name is in the list and has been marked absent, I would name yeah, Dr. Even managed also. Thank you. Dr. Vijaya and uh, Dr. Uma Meena. Are they uh, present? So I think it's the end of the session. Yeah. Hyde Park yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So I take the opportunity to thank uh, my co-panelists, co-chairman Dr. Tuhin Chaudhary, convener Dr. Arundhati Tamuli, co-convener Dr. Sudipta Mitra, and moderator Dr. Mohit Khatri. He had to leave because he is simultaneously running some instruction of course. And I thank AOS for this opportunity and all the audience Nice presentations by all. Thank you. Yeah. Same here. Beautiful presentations, each one of you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we will take one photograph with the presenters. Yes. Oh. So the presenters are required to please come forward. Please come. Forward, sir. Here. Yeah. 